Good morning, church. Hope you're enjoying the service so far. Daniel here. Um, <laughs> that's that, that music again. Uh, that's probably Phil putting that organ music in there. Um, he's probably put Reverend Daniel Daly at the bottom of the screen as well. But um, like, I'm not a reverend. I'm just a guy that goes to New Life and does some work with the teens. So, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> anyway. With this talk today, I'd like to try and raise three questions. Um, firstly, why did Jesus come in the flesh? Secondly, um, what was his purpose? What was the point of him coming? And then um, thirdly, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? So uh, firstly, when you look at the story, um, we're trying to render it in like a bit more 3D because the Bible doesn't really tell you too much about the emotions of um, Joseph namely Joseph and, and Mary, really, as they're in, in the passage, certainly at the beginning of this story, they're kind of key figures. Um, and it, it, like, it helps you to, to realise the situation that Jesus was kind of like being born into, so to speak. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, it, like they're, they're engaged, they're in their late teens, and um, but, but Mary is already with, with a child. So, um, again, the that probably would have created some kind of, um, people would have been gossiping maybe about them. People would have, you know, been pointing fingers at them saying perhaps, you know, adultery or, or fornication. Definitely, you know, you would have broken the mosaic laws and, you know, so there, there could have been some rejection there as well. Um, and again, this is the situation that kind of um, Jesus is being born into, but, you know, praise God, they put pull through um, they made it to Bethlehem and um, and Jesus was born. Um, but before they got there, they had a long uh, donkey ride, didn't they? They had a ride, excuse me, which which would have been like five five plus days to get there. Um, um, and for for a pe pregnant woman, that's <laughs> that's a lot to ask. Uh, to sit on a donkey for five days is um, a, a big ask, I think. Um, and I don't think. Too many uh, women would be running for that as their means of transportation, even just to get to the hospital, perhaps, which would have been maybe like a mile away, let's say, if, if you're going to the Royal Free from Tufnell Park or something like this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, five days is, is on a donkey ride. Is, uh, <laughs> that's an arduous task. But um, nonetheless, uh, again, she made it through. And I, I, I like to think that Mary, being a woman of faith, um, maybe would have um, been been pondering on in her heart, as the Bible says, on on uh, the fact that God is able to do the impossible. And that, you know, she, during that journey, she would probably would have, a, a whole gamut of things must have been running uh, through her mind. Um, but uh, one that sticks out to me is, this 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 idea this this um, answer that she gave the angel when um, when Jesus was announced to her um, that nothing is impossible for God um, uh, and so like again I think that that kind of feeds into the the family dynamic between her and Jesus as well I mean again if we look at uh, for example the the marriage at, at Cana where um, Mary and Jesus were invited and that the wines ran out. And uh, Jesus, so Mary comes to Jesus and says, oh, the, the, the wine's run out. And um, Jesus is like, well, you know, this doesn't concern me. What do you want me to do? And uh, the, the Bible doesn't really say if there was anything um, said between those two points. But really, um, I believe that Jesus being the discerner of, of hearts, he, he, he could see, he could see the faith in Mary. He could see that she trusted in him. Um, he could see that um, she knew that with God nothing was impossible. Again, that's that that family thing that they probably would have been nurtured um, in that household. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, that I think I believe that that pushed the, the faith that Mary had in him that pushed him to do that miracle. Um, again, when Jesus was being asked later on in, in the book of Matthew, we can see about the kingdom of heaven, and uh, he was trying to explain that it's harder for a rich man to enter into heaven than um, it is for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle. And um, his disciples were like, Well, you know, what does that mean for us? He said, Don't worry, you know, look. Um, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And again, I think that's, again, that's a, a little nod 
back to to Mary and the faith that that she may have had and that that would have been in that household um, to trust that God would, you know, but God is able, you know, and God is able to do um, anything, anything um, that that uh, is required, uh, in a sense. Um, and so they've 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 travelled now. They've um, they've travelled from from uh, Nazareth to 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 Bethlehem, and they've they've they've, they've reached the inn, and uh, Jesus has been born. Um, and he, Jesus has has guests. Um, he he's he's uh, on his behalf. Angels have been have invited the, um, the the shepherds to come and see him. And the, you know, shepherds at the time were the, considered the lowest uh, of the low um, back then. Um, they you know the Bible says that these the shepherds they just lived on the fields, um, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, he at his birth he's called these shepherds. But then I think again, if you really look at it, the, the shepherds will will have known about King David being Jews themselves, and in, or at least in that area, um, and then they will have known of of David being a shepherd as well. And so, I like to think <laughs> that they would be aware that um, it was David that wrote, um, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, I, I shall not, I shall not want, you know, and so um, here they are, these shepherds uh, coming to see the shepherd of shepherds. They, they're ultimately coming to see uh, the good shepherd, um, the one that David um, was was talking about. So they can relate to him in that sense, uh, being a shepherd themselves, um, and him and Jesus being a shepherd himself. Sorry. Um, and then you've got the kings, the the, the noblemen coming uh, to see to see Jesus as well. So he's called the lowest, and then now he's called the highest. Um, he's called those uh, the wisest, the richest, um, to all to to come, and they they've come to see the one that has given them their authority. I mean, it was quite a common thing for people to to understand that, um, or kings to understand that their authority came from God, it was a God-given thing. And so they'd come to see the King of Kings, um, which is quite a profound thing. And, and both these, um, in turn, uh, would have beheld uh, would have beheld this child, but this child that was God, <laughs> um, and, and been able to relate to him in so many different ways. So in asking uh, the first question again, uh, why did Jesus come in the flesh? I'd like to turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So there you have it. Jesus, equal to God, but chose to become a man. Equal to men, but chose to become a servant. And even as a servant, he chose the death of a guilty criminal, even though he was completely innocent. And as the Mosaic law, it clearly states that without the, without the spilling of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so it had to be him. He was perfect and sinless. He lived a perfect life. He was the Lamb of God that, that takes away the sin of the world, as, as John the Baptist used to say. And specifically, Jesus coming in the flesh. Why did he come in the flesh? So he could identify himself with us. He's now able to identify with every aspect of human living, the human condition. I love how um, Romans 8 puts it, verse, starting at verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so because he was sinless, he's he's now our he's now our blue blueprint, so to speak. He's he he beat he beat sin completely. And so now that's our pattern. Jesus is our pattern with us that live according to the spirit. So the next question, why come to earth at all? I love this next scripture. John 10, verse 10. I came that they might have life and that life more abundantly. Eternal life. What is it? John 17, verse 3. I love this scripture as well. <laughs> I love the whole Bible. You might be able to tell. Or maybe not. <laughs> John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the one true God. This is Jesus talking to our Father. That they know you, the one true God. And that they know me, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus came that we might have a loving, a loving union with God. We're adopted into the family now as, as beloved sons and daughters. He came to bring God to men and men, men to God. I love how uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And now I, I think this is not this is not talking about Paul is not talking about material wealth. Even though I do believe God blesses, yes, I do believe God blesses you, but with material things. But I think Paul is talking of of the incorruptible of spiritual things, of things that man wishes to attain but, but cannot because Jesus is the only way to attain these things. As the scripture said, he became poor that we might become rich. Rich with what? Rich in the grace of God, rich in the loving kindness of God, rich in the righteousness of Christ that covers us. That when, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus rich in the peace of God that transcends all understanding, rich in the joy of God, the joy of the Lord that gives us strength, that gives us strength to strengthen others, rich in the love of God, so unique, there before the beginning of time, that union, we're now included in that. And so my last question, what does it what does it mean for us? And simply I want to go to my last scripture here. I feel like this outlines it really well. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can fully trust him. We can fully, he, he knows us inside out. He knows what we face. We can go boldly. We're covered by his blood. We can go boldly and put our trust in him. Life will seem like a bumpy, <laughs> a bumpy journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem on a donkey back. Imagine, we have, we have the faith, we're carrying the faith with us. It's not easy, it's long. Life is long. But if we do what, what I believe Mary was doing along that way, along that journey, where she said to herself, it's long, it's tough, but with God all things are possible, then we will make it. We will make it to our destination where we get to behold our King, our God, face to face, where we get to bow down and worship face to face. And so again in this season, I wish to encourage you just to put your trust in Jesus and don't take for granted him coming to earth. 
this season. Amen.